Welcome to Off the Clock, the webcast of employment attorneys at Miller Johnson, where we discuss what is happening in the HR world and provide practical insight and advice. We are your co-hosts, Rebecca Strauss and Sarah Willey, two employment lawyers who spend their days guiding employers through all of the challenges that workplaces offer. So I am really excited about what we're going to talk about today. Are you really? I really, <laughs> I really am. I'm calling your bluff on that. Babe. One of my, for our listeners, one of my favorite things about Rebecca is that she delights in the Fair Labor Standards Act. She delights <laughs> in the Fair Labor Standards Act almost as much as I don't <laughs> delight in the Fair Labor Standards Act. So yeah. um, whenever I have questions, concerns. I get an email from a client asking things like, can somebody under the age of 17 work more than seven hours on a Saturday during (laughs) Christmas break, (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) et cetera? I can just forward it to Rebecca and she loves the answer. So we decided that um, we should do a Rebecca spin on our FMLA Q&A, right? Okay, awesome. And so today, it's my turn to fire questions at Rebecca about the Fair Labor Standards Act. Okay. I'm a little anxious because I, feel I like, sure hope I can answer these questions I feel live. like we're on a game show. Yes. Rebecca, I've gathered questions that people sent to us. Okay. And also just some of the more common questions that I've been getting okay under the FLSA I am can you tell I'm a little nervous I'm like it's like I'm in an airplane (laughs) (laughs) during turbulence okay well now you know how I feel when I get a client call about an FLSA drink cart (laughs) (laughs) okay we'll be okay I'll be fine I do love it and for those that have seen my trainings and presentations I have a big I heart uh, FLSA that I always promise people I will put on a hat or a t-shirt one day, but my IP lawyer husband has told me that's a trademark issue. <laughs> <laughs> With the I heart New With York. With the I heart? So um, really? someday when he's not looking, <laughs> I will do that for now. I just include it in oh, the slide Adam. that <laughs> flashes in front of people. But if I could have an I heart FLSA shirt on today. Those IP lawyers are always ruining the fun of employment lawyers, aren't they? (laughs) There is a yin and yang in our relationship. (laughs) After 25 years. All right, but talk about me and my marriage, Sarah. What do you have on the Fair Labor Standards Act? So the first question is this. It's a a broader question, okay? Okay. Um, I would love to hear from you about how COVID has impacted the way that employers should be thinking about their obligations under the FLSA, right? What uh, yes. What things should they be thinking about that maybe they weren't before? Or what are you seeing as common traps, common mistakes that okay. employers are making that they might not have, have thought about? Yep. So um, as with everything with COVID, it's shifted from the beginning until now. So I want to focus on what's current because okay. at the beginning, we were talking about reducing hours and salary, for instance, for exempt. Oh, I folks, remember, folks were, that. remember that. When we were. Um, now we can't find enough people. But at the beginning of this, we were looking at ways to cut back and cut down and how to maintain the salary uh, basis for paying people, et cetera. But let's just focus on what's current. Okay. Uh, what's going on now, not 19 months into the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, probably the number one issue is keeping track of time yes. for employees who are working remotely. Yep. That was true at the beginning, but it's just as true now. And frankly, maybe even a little bit more true because it was a fire drill 19 yep. months ago, as we know. Um, but now people are starting to say, this might be a permanent work arrangement. Yes. I really need a solution I can count on, right? That will be accurate, that I can rely on if someone later says I actually worked. Uh, 60 hours a week. Technology can help you here, right? Okay. And I strongly recommend you use it. It's okay. not terribly burdensome. There's apps for on the phone when people log into their computer, et cetera, et cetera. But you should have a way that's not a time clock on a wall, right? Because people, some people are not physically showing up for work, right, in a physical place anymore. 
So you do need to good timekeeping for your non-exempt Right. Employees. So that was my, just to be clear for our listeners, when you talk about having to keep track of um, how much and when people are are working, you mean for your non-exempt employees, For your correct? non-exempt employees. That's okay. correct. Uh, the other piece that's been big during COVID for particularly remote workers is the continuous workday rule actually was formally changed by the DOL during COVID because of COVID. What is what is the continuous workday rule? And I know a lot of rule? folks just completely missed it because they were trying to figure out how to shut down a facility right. and not, not on DOL regulations changing. Uh, but the continuous workday rule is a regulation that was, again, recently modified at the beginning of COVID. And it means that, generally speaking, from the time a person starts work until the time they stop at the end of the day, everything in between is compensable work time, except for... Uh, bona fide breaks, right, of 30 minutes or more. The DOL, because of COVID, modified that and said that you can work in chunks, right? We're not going to, we, we don't want that continuous workday rule to constrain people unnecessarily who are working from home and also, for instance, have child care responsibilities, okay. right, because schools and daycares were closed. So maybe you can work from 5 to 8 in the morning, right? take a break from 8 to 11 to help your child with online school, then work 11 to 2, and then maybe work in the evening from 7 to 10. By the way, that sounds horrible. Because right. <laughs> I think I've got that person working from 5 a.m. until <laughs> 11 uh, p.m. night, so I am sorry to that employee. But, <laughs> but at the beginning of this, that's what a lot of us with children were dealing yeah, with, absolutely. as we know, and some of us still are, some of our employees right, are still dealing with okay. those issues, even if it's just temporarily. Maybe school shuts down just for two weeks because COVID, right, has broken out. Or maybe your child has to quarantine for two weeks because they've been exposed. So this is still a real thing for a lot of your employees. So just remember, uh, for your non-exempt employees, they can work in chunks throughout the day. But to your original point, the critical piece to that is going to be having accurate time records yes. showing. So is it enough to have an arrangement with an employee that says, here are your assigned work hours? It's the God awful schedule that you just <laughs> sorry gave yeah. us. Is it enough to agree to that? Or should those employers have that non-exempt employee clock be remotely clocking in and out or handwriting their time? How should they yeah. be doing that? That's a great question that I get a lot throughout the years, not just during COVID, but right. year in and year out. The And the law surprises some people. Uh, probably not you. <laughs> Maybe some of our it listeners. Might. The law does not actually require at timekeeping in the sense of a time clock or a punching, if you will, mm -hmm. in and out, whether that's done electronically now or not doesn't even require people to handwrite on a time card, right? It just requires that the employer keep a record of how many hours the employee worked. Now, the best evidence of that is contemporaneous timekeeping. That's why so many employers require that for non-exempt right. employees, right? Because if looking back on it a year or two later, uh, there's a dispute about when the employee was actually working. Mm -hmm. Well, the best evidence of that is gonna be contemporaneous records the employee themselves completed sure. at, on that day they were working. But it's not actually required. And so it is possible, sorry to your question, it is possible to have what I call a schedule-based timekeeping system, which is okay. also sometimes called an exception-based system, yep. which is, a, a take that screwy schedule out right. of it for a moment. Let's just take an eight to five schedule. You are expected to be working eight to five every day uh, with a one hour unpaid lunch break. Mm -hmm. And we will, so you're supposed to work eight hours a day. We will expect and assume you are working those eight hours a day. If you do not, if you work more or less on any day for any reason at all, here is how you tell us. That's the exception part That's of it. That's the exception. And that should be in writing. Mm -hmm. That policy should be in writing. But what about the exception? You should keep a record of the exceptions, Of the correct? person requesting the yes. exception, saying, I yes. actually worked three extra hours. Correct. Absolutely. You need to keep a record of that because the Fair Labor Standards Act does require you to keep a record of how long each person worked, note, on a weekly basis, not on a daily basis. Okay. So they can even tell you at the end of the week, this week I worked an extra five hours, which blows people's minds to hear that uh, because most people think of it as a daily issue. But 
everything in the Fair Labor Standards Act, everything is weekly, 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 weekly. Not pay, okay. not pay period, not daily, not monthly, weekly. So an employer with a remote employee really has two options. They can first use one of those systems that, quite frankly, are um, very common now where you yeah. clack in and out on your computer, right? Yep. That's what we do here at Miller Johnson, com- quite frankly. Com- Even for people who are in person, they just clack in, in and out right on their on their computer. Yes. Um, you could do that, or alternatively, you could follow that scheduled approach in which you agree to a schedule in writing yep. and then um, establish how those exceptions would be made and then keep records of all of those exceptions so Correct. that if two years from now you have to explain how you knew Sarah worked 40 hours on these particular weeks, you could you could be able to do that. Absolutely. That's correct. Got it. Okay. Now, speaking of things that changed during COVID that people might not have noticed, I recently have had a few clients not realize that the salary basis changed. Yeah, yeah they snuck that in just they at the beginning of COVID. They snuck that in. So I do feel like we need to mention this. Yes, uh, yes. Um, so if we remember a few years ago under the Obama administration, a little bit of history. I'm sorry. I like talking about this stuff too much. <laughs> under the Obama administration, most people re- will remember there was a proposal, a regulation that increased the minimum salary level for exempt employees uh, to be quite high, right, in the 50s. Yep. Um, and then that was struck down by a Texas court. Where I remember that. The court it went goes away to. overnight. Overnight. Uh, I was literally calling and emailing clients past midnight saying stop right (laughs) Right? so so then it was still the lower number but just as covid was breaking uh the department of labor issued a regulation that found kind of a middle ground so that salary basis number that minimum salary did go up in 2020 and it went up to 684 a week okay 684 a week is the new minimum salary for your exempt employees there is a little more nuance to it, and if I we really want to travel to Nerdville, I can explain it to you. But it might be a little too much for us all. On you know, I like to meet you in Nerdville. <laughs> I know, but I'm not sure if our clients do. Uh, so I'll just mention this, and if anyone has further questions about, it, they should reach out to someone, me or anyone at Miller right. Johnson. But there is a way to use bonus and incentive compensation to make up part of that ten percent, right? It's subject to certain limitations; it has to be paid a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so um, a lot of clients are not going down that route because of the bookkeeping and whatnot. Yeah. But if that is something you want to explore, please feel free to reach out to us. Okay. Speaking of the salary basis test. Okay. All right. I'm ready. What does this executive, administrative, professional, what people commonly refer to as EAP, not Employee Assistance Program, by the way. That's a different EAP. Yes. Okay. What does that mean under the FLSA and what does that have to do with the FLSA? So this is kind of what I would call basic FLSA, but we continue to get many, many uh, questions about this, either because people are newer to HR and are working through it for the first time, or the concepts they're very familiar with, but when it comes drilling down to a specific person in a specific position, right. it becomes difficult to apply, right, in specific situations. So so the, what I refer to as EAP, which to your point, is not an employee assistance program. Perhaps it's it, your Perhaps EAP. it's the opposite of an employee <laughs> program there's nothing um, there's nothing assistance about no it. there's nothing helpful about this at all <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of categories of individuals who could qualify to be exempt from the fair labor standard acts uh, overtime requirements okay. overtime and some minimum wage right and some of them are minimum some wage of them, some are not very few minimum wage to lawyers and doctors are two of the few lawyers doctors and teachers right um, are the three major categories so did you know we don't even have to be paid minimum wage let yes. alone overtime. I, we could literally be paid two dollars an hour. We could, uh, although I don't think I don't. I haven't met many lawyers that no, would likely. Do I don't a, think we're paying what, you two dollars an hour. <laughs> what we do for two dollars an hour. But cat. anyway, yes. Okay. So the idea is, if somebody falls under one of these exemptions, then yes. we don't have to pay them overtime if Correct. they work more than forty hours a week. But we yes. can't just um, decide 
we're paying you a weekly salary and that's what you get. They have to actually fall into a specified exemption in order for an employer to do that. And it can right? be a little trickier than people may think. So right. again, there's all kinds of exemptions, but the EAPs are, are the three That's the most biggest common. ones. So those are the ones I'm going to talk about right. uh, today. Right. But there's all sorts of motor carriers, individuals who deliver newspapers, work in movie Sales, theaters, et cetera, et cetera. Computer exemptions. Yeah, computer is a, is a big one. Uh, but let's talk about the EAPs. That's executive, administrative, and professional. Okay. And to fit into one of those exemptions, which means you don't have to track their hours, you don't have to pay them overtime, they have to meet the minimum salary test. Which is? 684 a week. Every week, no matter what, Every right? week, no matter what. There are six exceptions to that, uh, which we're not going to go into today. The two biggest ones are first week of work and last week of work. So there are slightly, but if you're not, if that person's not making their minimum salary every week, you should think long and hard about why and probably call us. Right. So they have to be paid the same minimum salary every week. And that salary is not reduced subject to By quantity the, or quality. Yes. Although I just have to say a word about my friend, the FMLA. Here. Which is actually a section of the FLSA. <laughs> so we're still talking about the not to pull rank on you, but go ahead, Sarah. One of the <laughs> one of the exceptions to that salary basis is unpaid FMLA leave. Correct. Just so everybody understands that. That right? is absolutely because I'm sure there, <laughs> our listeners are off course thinking about the FMLA too. So yeah. So yeah. So you have to 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 fall into an exemption. You have to first be paid on a salary basis. Yep. And um, at least the minimum amount. Which is, in my view, the easy part. That's fairly objective. Yes. Right? You either are or you aren't. And then you get to the harder part, which is do you do the work that qualifies for that exemption? The primary duty test, and that is, that's where the rubber hits the road. It does. Right? And that's where even for the most sophisticated IHR professionals who can cite the rules as well as I can, right, we still have conversations, right? Because sure. how do we apply it in specific situations? Uh, in general, it's important to remember that almost every exempt employee, someone who is entitled to be exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act, does some non-exempt work during the day. Mm -hmm. A CEO may make coffee on her way in every morning, right? But that does not mean that she is not exempt because Good one point. of the things she does is make the coffee, which, by the way, is a non-exempt duty. Yes. Uh, spoiler alert on that, <laughs> right? So, so that's an extreme example, but right. how do we balance that, right? Employees who do some non-exempt tasks, if you think about instead of tasks, instead of a person, a person is not exempt or non-exempt, kind of the they position. are under the Fair Labor Standards Act, right. but for the purpose of this analysis is the task that the person does, mm -hmm. uh, does that qualify as exempt or non-exempt? Right. And they're going to do more than one task, hopefully, or they're pretty bored at work. And so for individuals that do more than one task during a day, what are their primary tasks? What are they actually What doing? are their primary duties? And what's the, isn't it, isn't it important to understand what the purpose of the position itself yes. is, right? What are those core duties? What does this position exist to do right, There's the CEO doesn't ways exist to, to make think coffee, about it. Why example. does this person? Why did for someone that you know makes a decent amount of money? Why do we pay them that much money? Right. Is it to lead the organization or is it to make coffee? Okay. Another way to think about it is if this person didn't do these other things, could someone else just do it? Right. right. Is that why we have this particular person with this right. skill That's set? A good point. One okay. way to think about it, um, which isn't the, necessarily uh, the an the answer. But one way to maybe start thinking about it is how much of the person's weekly time is spent on the exempt tasks versus the non-exempt yeah. tasks. Okay. Now, there is this concept that some people may have heard of. It's this 50% rule. Some states, okay, after I'm done this, you're, you're done with this thought. You're going to give the, I'll, the I'll state give the by state, state exemption. Yes. But at least in California, for instance, under their uh, wage and hour rules, right, they have a 50% Task, which is you look at how much, literally how much time this, this employee spent does. in a week doing these tasks versus those right. tasks, and the exempt tasks have to be more than 50% of right. the week. Now, the Department of Labor, the Federal Department of Labor, has played around with adopting that rule. They almost did a few years ago and then pulled back from it. Okay. So under federal law, 
Uh, there is not that, not that 50% percent rule, but if you have an employee who's performing exempt tasks far more than 50%, that is certainly a point we would make if you were challenged on okay. an exemption decision. And it's important, again, and, and we'll move on past this, but just to emphasize it, it's in, the risk to having an exempt, the risk to having an employee classified as exempt incorrectly mm -hmm. is that they can then go back after the fact and claim unpaid overtime yes. for two years and maybe three years if they can show that we acted um, in bad faith or intentionally, Correct. right? Um, and that, and the real bugaboo is for those exempt folks, usually we, we're not keeping track of their time because Correct. we're paying them on a salary. And so that individual who's claiming unpaid overtime gets to just kind of say how much they worked, right? Mm -hmm. Which is usually something like 80 hours a week. Yes. And unless we can disprove that, right? So it is it, it is important. And then there's liquidated damages and it gets doubled. Which is doubled so and, and you pay their attorney's fees. The number gets the high very fast. The risk here is real. The number the, gets high The risk fast. here is real. So it is important. Okay, yes. one last question on that. Is it okay if we have an, an employee that could be classified as exempt, is it okay to instead say, this person um, is never gonna work more than 40 hours a week, their regular schedule is 30 hours a week, so we're just gonna pay them by the hour. We're not gonna classify them as exempt. We're, we're instead gonna classify them as non-exempt. Is that okay? Okay, that's a great question, and I'm gonna say yes, but, or maybe yes and, <laughs> right? That's what everyone's learning right. now in these, um, team building exercises is the yes right. and skill. So yes it is, just because someone is entitled to be qualified or could be qualified as exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act does mean not you have, you have to. to pay them that way. Right. The classic example are RNs and hospitals. Right. Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, right in the regs, it says RNs are entitled to be yeah, exempt. They almost never are. But very few right. floor nurses, you know, some in administrative positions, et cetera. But but clinical nurses, very few are paid on a salary basis, almost all are that's paid on an hourly okay. basis. So so that's the classic example I usually use. But here's the yes and part. If you're gonna do that, if you think of this through and that's your thought process and you decide I, I can classify them as exempt but I'm not going to, I strongly suggest you put that in writing to the employee. Okay. And as a as a follow up question I often get can I have two employees yes. with the same job? Exactly. That's what I was Can one ask be me. exempt and one not? Right. The answer is yes, assuming the exempt person is entitled to under the rules, I strongly suggest you explain the difference in writing right. to okay. the employee. The most com common example Otherwise, it leads I get, to confusion. Right. That's, that's the problem. It leads to a lot of confusion otherwise. And the most common example I get on that is an employer who, for one reason or another, wants to do a better job of keeping track of how much somebody's working who mm -hmm. could be classified as exempt, okay. right? And so they decide we're going to classify them as non-exempt, pay them by the hour, um, yep. and have them keep track of their hours and pay them right. hourly instead. And the explanation that I'm strongly recommending, because I've seen people get tied up in knots of this later, uh, on several occasions, is it, it doesn't have to be a whole encyclopedic explanation of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Almost everyone has a form or a letter, right, that says you are classified as exempt, exempt non-exempt. Non For folks in that situation, you can have non you qualify under the Fair Labor Standards Act but right, to be paid on an exempt a, basis, but we are paying you as a non-exempt. Yes. Employee. That's all. It, do, it doesn't have to be so that the position longer doesn't than that. Get, okay. that. That way, if you switch it back to exempt, excellent. Um, th that you are um, you are putting yourself at risk okay. if you don't explain that to employees. Great. Okay. And now my twenty second public service announcement about state laws. Right. Our conversation <laughs> today is focused on the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. Right. Correct. So, listeners, remember to please. <laughs> So please, please, please know your wage and hour state laws because there are different requirements across the board. Uh, payment uh, of wages, minimum wage, when you have to pay for breaks, what breaks you have to pay for, even 
the white collar exemptions. Yeah, I'm going to There add are a, different rules, especially yes. and if you're if you've got folks in California, right? Uh, you got to know that. So. And that includes remote workers in California. Maybe you only have one facility. Yes. But you hired someone to work remotely Absolutely. during COVID, and they're still working remotely, and they're sitting in California yep. or in another state. Yep. Um, one thing that people don't realize that states are different on is even that minimum salary amount. So, so just my quick PSA on that, a little history lesson. Remember, I said back during the Obama administration, it was suggested that it be moved quite a bit higher, and then the court struck that down. What several states did in response is they raised it to that amount just within their own states. Ah, so okay. you may have a different minimum salary amount to maintain that exemption basis in different states. And if okay. you have remote workers... You might not have noticed yeah, that. If you have different facilities, my guess is you may have thought about this, right? If you have an actual physical facility, Maybe. may or right. may not, hopefully. If you have folks that are working remotely for the first time because mm -hmm. of COVID... You probably have not thought about that, okay. would be my guess. Okay. Okay. Enough about the state-by-state state stuff. What, okay. What's next? Next question. Breaks. Ah. Do I have to pay employees <laughs> for bathroom breaks, for what we used to call smoke breaks, although those might be like e-cigarette vaping, vaping yeah. breaks now? I'm not quite sure what those are. Hot what those smoking breaks? <laughs> weed, weed breaks, et cetera. <laughs> Do I have to pay? And, and by the way, no, we don't have to. <laughs> let me be clear. We don't have to let anybody smoke weed during work at all, much less pay them to take a break to do that, right? And again, this is another one that you, you're you going to give us the rules under the Fair Labor Standards Act, but this is a common state law oh, yes. area, too. So and what I is am going to give you the rule for uh, employees 18 and older, too, because okay. once we get into minor employment, we get okay. all over the place. All right, so, so what's for, the rule for... What's the federal law requirement yeah. for people who are 18 years and old? Uh, first of all, the law, the Fair Labor Standards Act, does not require any breaks at all. That's number one. That surprises a lot of people. That surprised Even me when I HR. first started doing what I'm doing. Yes, yes, I was very surprised. I get that question from friends and family, and it surprises people. Yep. However, uh, if your employees do get breaks, which obviously from an employee relations perspective uh, we recommend, uh, it, the Department of Labor has said 30 minutes or more does not have to be paid. 20 minutes or less does. So we can talk about that. what happens between 20 and 30 minutes and why. Yeah, that's... <laughs> to me, it's just the Department of Labor providing work for lawyers. I think that was a gift because you really should. If you're providing breaks between 20 and 30 minutes, you really need to talk that through with us <laughs> because it's the DOL said that's a gray area that's decided on a case-by-case -case basis. This is why you may notice that most employers They're provide breaks either 20 or 30. that are either 30 minutes or longer or 20 minutes or less, although I do have clients that have some in between. Okay, so now let's take the 20 minute or less break, because those are typically the bathroom breaks, right? Yes. The smoke breaks, the vape breaks, And again, the to be clear, we're talking about for non-exempt employees. We don't Correct. have to worry about paying for breaks for exempt employees. Okay. Right. Exempt employees get paid same again, amount, regardless same amount of breaks week, or how much they, they work. take Got breaks. It. Okay, so for so for non-exempt employees, if the break is under twenty minutes, you do have to pay them, even for smoke breaks, unless even if it's once an hour, unless yes. it's FMLA leave. <laughs> Correct, because for instance, frequent bathroom breaks I fall under the FMLA. Could be <laughs> right. That could be an intermittent FMLA situation. Could be. But let's not go down that rabbit no. hole because we just no. heads just exploded. So let's assume <laughs> it's not based on a medical mm -hmm. issue. Okay, let's so let's just take the smoke break. Assuming no one has a doctor's right. note saying they have to smoke once an hour. Um, I still get this question, and I get it even from sophisticated clients uh, that do not pay. And they do not pay as a way to discourage the smoke breaks. But not paying is not a tool in your toolbox to manage this okay. issue. I am not saying you have to pay for smoke breaks once an hour and allow people to take smoke breaks once an hour. I'm saying if they take a break for less than 20 minutes, you have to pay it no matter what they're doing okay. on that break. But you can say you may not take a smoke break. Right. And discipline them if they do. And discipline them if they do. Got it. But discipline if, is a tool in your toolbox. But if it's less toolbox. than 20 minutes, you have to pay them but for it. But not paying people is not a tool in your toolbox okay. for managing that issue. Okay. But if it's a break of 30 minutes or more and they're truly relieved from work, 
yep. then you do not have to pay them. For they that. have to be truly relieved. Yes. That can get into a very that nuanced can get, that gets into discussion, a whole, which we can't it. get. But generally, the, the general rule is truly relieved okay. from work. And why, one more add on on the smoke break issue. Why is that the question that keeps coming up? Because people have to smoke outside, right? Because right. of rules that changed over the yes. years. And a lot of employers have rules. This is where people get caught up, I'm telling you. They have rules when you leave the building, you punch out. And when you come back in, you punch back in. So they can keep track of who is in the building. Right. So an employee takes a 10-minute smoke break. They punch out when they leave. Oh, and then they, they don't punch get paid in when they it. come back in. And the payroll system is up and then not to pay them for that time. So that is where the rubber hits the road yes. on that issue. And where people who, again, know the rules as well as I do, still find that the organization is making mistakes. So you may have to adjust your punch in, punch out rules or the way that that rule is applied when it comes to short smoke breaks that are outside. Okay. That okay. Kind of I'm going to on ask that. one more question and then we do have questions that we didn't get to, but that's okay because we'll do this. This will be a continuing yep. FLSA Q and A, but one more question. The regs for... are 800 pages with small print. We can do this every day for the rest of our careers. Okay. Just, <laughs> just one more question. Cause I sure. think the answer to this is, pretty quick. Can we pay exempt employees more than their usual salary to reward them uh, for working extra or maybe for a job well done or for stepping in and yep. doing other work, which is an increasingly common question I'm getting with the workforce shortage, right? Yep. We're having exempt folks step in and drive school buses yep. do and do work. patient care and yep. actually work the manufacturing line, et cetera. That's a great question. If they're exempt, can 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 we reward them for that? Yes. Yes. Is that a short enough answer? I'll build on it a little bit. I will say there is a regulation directly on point with this because okay. that answer surprises some people. So this is not an interpretation, right, of some opinion letters or something like that. There is a regulation directly on point, and the regulation says that you can pay people uh, even based on an hourly rate for extra work. That surprises a lot of people. But you can say, exempt person, we generally expect you to work 50 hours a week, 40 hours a week, whatever it is. If you work more than that, we will pay you $20 an hour. For or even every if you're hour willing to that. do this other work, yes. we will pay you to do it at a rate of $20 an hour. And yes. so long as their core position doesn't change, they remain exempt. Okay, that is such a great question. Even though they're doing some non-exempt work yes. on the side, right? This is a great point. I know you wanted a short answer to this whole line, but I can't help it. It's a fairly We got to play it out. We got to play okay. it out. A, per a person, an, an employee is either exempt or non-exempt. Right. They cannot be both. Right. Even if they have more than one job function at an organization. So get your head around that for just a moment. Okay. They cannot be exempt on Saturdays and Sundays, for instance, but non-exempt Monday through Friday or vice versa. That is not the way it works. Okay, so let's take an example. HR person is running the manufacturing line mm -hmm. for two hours a day to help with the yep. shift overlap because we're sh so short-staffed. Yep. Or even for a full day a week, HR person has to step in and work on the line. Yep. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, my HR folks are not going to love exempt. this. exempt. And by the way, it's an exempt. Right, it's in, this is an it's HR It's the HR leader. director. First of all, the sorry, HR directors, the organization does not have to pay you anything extra for that work if it doesn't want to because you're exempt salary, right. which means they can just pay you that salary no matter how much work you do in a week. Now, that's not good employee relations, right? And not good motivation to so have they can you do if it. They want. So they then can pay you additional. It can be a, a, just a, a set amount, $500 mm -hmm. a week. It can be per hour. It can be uh, whatever they like, it, the kind of the sky's the limit. So they could say HR person is going to do their job. HR director is going to do that job all week. Mm -hmm. And then you got to come in on the weekend and run production, help run production Saturday, Sunday. Um, employer could pay your same salary for all of that work if they wanted to because you remain exempt, yep. even though you're doing some non-exempt work. It's not your primary duty. 
Alternatively, they could also, as an incentive, a reward, a thank you, whatever you want to call it, yeah. um, they could pay you to do that weekend work even by the hour. Yes. Um, as um, on top of your weekly salary. Yes. Okay. I Okay. What? I, one more little caveat, and then we will wrap it up. As with everything with the Fair Labor Standards Act, documentation is really, yes, really important. Yes, I was going to say. I suggest if you can do yep. it with your payroll service, a separate line item for that. So the salary line stays the same, right? right? Every and then week extra of every pay. year. And then yes. extra pay. Bonus, Incentive extra pay or whatever. Incent it is. Yes, I, I do recommend that, or it can lead to a lot of confusion. And putting in writing that arrangement with the employee, how yes. that's going to work should be in writing one way or another, whether it be if it's not written, of, it didn't happen. Right. Exactly. It could be yeah. an email. It could be some standalone document, et cetera. Okay. Correct. Yep. All right. Well, well, that was fun. This was fun. Do you think other people had fun or was to it just To be me? continued. <laughs> to be continued. Thank you. All Have right. a good rest of your day, yeah, Sarah. Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca.